Greetings, Verilog friends. If you've written any amount of Verilog, you've wondered how you can test that your Verilog actually works, and typically you're going to write some unit tests to stimulate your module and see that the output is as you expected. So the only problem with this is that um, it does rely on you picking your unit tests extremely carefully and assuming that those unit tests are characteristic of the module and that you don't have to write any more unit tests. So unit tests are great because you know it will tell you whether your module does what you think it does in a certain way and when you change your module you can rerun your unit tests to see if there are any regressions. Um, but there is another method which is maybe a little more rigorous and it's called formal verification. And the idea here is that you specify what properties your module must have and uh, then you run it through basically a magical mathematical filter um, called a satisfiability solver. And what that does is it tries to disprove that those properties hold at any particular point using any particular input you basically assert that this property is absolutely true and then the solver tries to prove that that's false and if it can't then you've got a pretty good mathematical proof that your module is correct with respect to those properties so of course you have to pick those properties well but it's a little more rigorous than uh, unit testing well, let's talk about how to get started now I'm going to specifically talk about Yosis uh, and Symbiosis because those are both uh, open source and free. In addition, they are convenient because they will take your Verilog code and compile it to certain FPGAs, uh, some Lattice FPGAs, a few Xilinx FPGAs, and there are a few others in that mix, but it's all free and it's all very fast. So I have a simple one pager here and you can uh, get the URL for this down below. So if you're on Linux or OS X, uh, this will be extremely easy to follow. All you have to do is open up a terminal or a command window and you know do the instructions that are in this document and you're done. If you're on Windows, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I'm not going to be using Windows, I'm actually going to be using the Windows subsystem for Linux because now I'm on Linux basically. Um, if you don't know what Windows subsystem for Linux is, uh, it's basically a Linux shell inside of Windows um, and you would be well advised to make sure that the Windows subsystem for Linux is working on your system. So there are a few formal verification modes that I'd like to talk about. One is called the bounded model checker. The other is called prove or the prover. And the third is called cover. So let's talk about bounded model checking. So let's suppose you had a simple binary counter that goes, one, that goes from zero to one, to two, to three, and then back to zero. So you can probably think that in order to verify that the counter actually works, uh, you set it to some state, and then you clock it, and then it should go to the next state, and the next state, and the next state, and the next state. So let's uh, say that if you are in state 0 then the next state should be 1 and if you're in state 1 then the next state should be 2 and from 2 you should go to 3 and from 3 you should go to 0. So it's also pretty clear that some of the disallowed transitions would be from 0 to 2 or from 2 to 0 or from 1 to 3 um, from 2 to 1 you don't want to go backwards and on and on and on. So if we consider the current state as n and the previous state as m, then you can see that we have a bunch of state transitions. So for example, this is the entire state. So you have state 0 and 1 
that goes to state one and two, that goes to state two and three, that goes to state three and zero, and then it goes back to here. And there's a bunch of other illegal states like zero to two, or two to zero, or you know, two to one, or one to three. And there's a whole bunch of illegal states that sort of surround this valid bunch of states. So these are all the valid states, valid, right? And outside, you would have all the invalid states. And the idea behind bounded model checking is that given starting from a valid state, you remain within the valid states, then you've checked your model for being bounded. In other words, in other words, given an initial state and clocking it for a certain number of states, you never enter the invalid state space. So it's pretty clear that the number of state transitions you check is pretty important because, of course, if you had, say, a 64-bit counter, well, you know, and you start from zero, you would want to check two to the 64 states to make sure that you remain within your valid state space. So we're going to start off with a simple combinatorial module. There's no clocking, nothing like that. Uh, so I started off with some uh, simple skeleton code. Um, basically, what I like to do is I like to protect my Verilog module using this uh, standard uh, sort of include protection uh, so that if you have other modules that also include simple.v, then this module will only be included once. Um, default net type to none, uh, because when you define your nets, it could be either a wire or a register, and if you forget to do that, then this will complain. Um, and then this is just a useful time scale for simulation and traces. So I'm just going to call this a simple module, and let's suppose I want to make a simple adder, right? So I'm going to have an input. And I'm going to call it logic. Usually you say wire or register, but in the latest versions of Yosis um, and Icarus Verilog, uh, you're allowed to say logic. And the reason for that is that it was kind of confusing uh, when, when you're supposed to use wire and when you're supposed to use reg. So uh, the powers that be decided that, well, you know, let's just say logic and it's up to the tool to figure it out. So. Uh, and I'm going to make it a 64-bit adder. So we'll just call this, uh, I don't know, um, A. And we have also B. And the output is also 64-bit, and we'll call it S. Or maybe we'll just call it Y. So. And actually, I said this was going to be an adder. Let's make it a subtractor. Okay, so since this is combinatorial, I can just say assign y equals a minus b. But let's implement it using two's complement. Let's suppose, you know, I didn't want to use subtractors for whatever reason. So I'm going to do a plus, now the two's complement of b is simply the inverse of b or the negation of b plus 1. Okay, so this is sub subtract y equals a minus b. Now, this should implement subtraction, but how can we prove it? Well, I mean, if we were to do unit cases, uh, unit tests, we would check a few values of a and b and check the output, and if those few unit tests seem to work, then we declare that the module works. But of course, that's not exhaustive. So let's go to uh, our formal module. Now, usually what you can do is you can uh, include your formal assertions into the module that you're testing and protect them using this. So here's where your assertions go here. I don't 
typically do that because I sort of like to just stick with the public API. I don't really want to test any internal state. You can, but I'm not going to at this point. Okay, so here is a skeleton for my simple formal module. I declare the module up here. I'm including the module that I want to test, and I'm including an instance of the module. So what you do is you uh, take your formal module and you copy over the API for the module that you want to test. So these are the things that uh, the formal verification will be able to use. Now here, where I instantiate my symbol module, I'm just going to copy the signals. You don't have to do this. I am aware that there is a, um, a simple way to simply say all of the named signals are the same as they're named in your module. But I typically don't like to do that because what if like one of the names is different? So anyway, so now I have the module instantiated and now I am going to begin my formal test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say always if any signal changes, I'm going to assert that y is equal to a plus uh, a minus b. Okay. Now uh, the syntax checker is going to complain about this, and this is unfortunately because iVerilog doesn't understand assert statements. So uh, we'll just accept this as it is. Now notice that what I'm doing is I'm implementing subtraction one way and I'm testing it a different way. And this is important because if you tested it in exactly the same way as you coded it, then all you'll be doing is testing whether you can copy and paste code properly, which is not what you want to test. You basically want to assert that some property about your module exists even though your module doesn't explicitly uh, implement that property. Okay, so now we have to define a configuration file. Um, so under tasks, we're just going to do bounded model checking for now. Uh, the options specifically for the bounded model checking task is that the mode has to be bounded model checking. This is just the way that symbiosis works. Um, this depth doesn't actually matter because I don't really have clocks, but we're just going to keep it that way. Engines, I'm just going to use the default of SMT BMC. There are other engines that you can use, but I'll just stick with this. Doesn't really matter at this point. So the script is you want to read in formal mode, and when you read something in formal mode, it defines that formal define in system Verilog syntax. Uh, simple formal dot v. This is your top level file and then you want to prep as the top level module simple formal. So there's my top level module. And finally you just list out the files that need to be included in the compilation and in this case it's just going to be simple formal and simple. Okay so now let's run it. Okay, so now let's run this. Uh, we do have to run SBY under Windows as sudo uh, because unfortunately SBY, which is a Python program, attempts to set resource limits and apparently in the Windows subsystem for Linux, you can't set resource limits unless you are sudo. So let's just run this and see what happens. Okay, and if we look down at the bottom, we can see done. So what this does, and, and you can sort of see in the logs that it's checking assumptions and assertions in step zero, step one, step two, and so on, all the way up to step nine. Of course, these steps are all gonna be the same because there's no clock, really. Um, so what this has done is it's basically said, in all cases, this, is mathematically equivalent to this in every single case. So basically I've checked all cases of A and B against Y. So I didn't have to do this exhaustively, but this was proven mathematically. 
Now you can imagine that you have some more complicated logic and you can do that. Um, so let's suppose I made a mistake in, uh, in my module and I didn't add one. Let's suppose I just did that by mistake. Now let's see what happens if I try to prove that this works. Well, it says fail, and when it fails, it will give you a trace. So that's right here, engine sub zero, trace.vcd. And we can run GTK wave, which is a nice viewer for, for VCD waveforms. And uh, the directory it puts it in is, uh, let's see, simple formal BMC. So simple formal BMC engine zero trace VCD. So it basically is saying your assumption is false, uh, your assertion is false, and here is a trace that shows where your assertion went bad. So let's pull these out. So what I did was I just selected my simple formal module. It tells me all the signals in simple formal module. I'm clicking on the first one, shift clicking on the last one, and then I'm gonna hit append. And indeed, A and B, and there's Y. So obviously I did something wrong and then I would have to go back and you know try to debug Y. So let's set this back to one. And then we can run it again, and we're done. Let's talk about the cover mode. Now, in cover mode, what we want to do is find out if a given state can actually be reached from your initial state. So let's suppose you want to cover this case, and you want to find out, is it actually possible to get into that state from, say, you know, this state? And you also give it a certain number of um, transitions to go through. In this case, you know, you can have a minimum of three transitions because obviously in two transitions, you can't get into the state three comma zero. So what cover allows you to do is say, here's a situation I want to find out. So this is kind of useful to, to say, uh, I want my module to end up in this state. How do I get into this state? Now, cover is also interesting to use in this case. Um, what we can do is we can add a cover statement. So cover the case where y is equal to, uh, there's 64 bits of hex, um, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, a, b, c, d, um, e, f, 9, 9. Well, here, let's just make it simple, right? OK, a, 0, uh, a, 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 a. That's kind of an interesting case. Now, what cover will do, if I go into the SBY file, and I also add a cover task and say, in the cover task, your mode is cover. So what this will actually do is it will run the cover statements and it will attempt to find a sequence of inputs that will result in this output. So in other words, what we're asking is, uh, what values of a, my, a and B result in an output of A, 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 A? So if we run it, okay, so the first part was uh, the BMC, bounded model checking. The second part was the cover. And cover gives us a different trace. So it's basically saying, for your cover statement, here is the trace that reaches that state. So let's go ahead and open up the trace. So I'm going to go to cover, and I think it's trace zero. So it says what the file is here. And let's see what it found, A, B, and Y. Who knows what it's going to find? It, it, it's essentially random, but um, OK, well, um, zero minus this value, 5556, five, five, turns out to be A, 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 A. Great. And you, know, you could do this by hand, and you can find out that, yes, it's correct. So this is kind of useful to, to say, uh, I want my module to end up in this state. How do I get into this state? So that's kind of nice. Now let's go into something a little more complicated, uh, clocked logic. And this is where induction comes in. Let's talk about the prove mode. Now let's talk about prove mode, also known as induction mode. 
So the idea here, uh, just as in your basic high school class where you might have learned about mathematical induction, what you do is you prove a base case. You know, let's just call it base case. What you do is you prove that if your base case is allowed and some other case leads to a valid state transition, regardless of what this case is, as long as this is a valid state, then prove that this state is also valid. So if your base case is valid, and some starting state is valid, and regardless of what that starting state is, the next state is determined to also be valid, then by definition, all of your states are going to be valid. Okay, so I'm going to start with my skeleton, and I'm going to define two signals. One is just an input clock, and the other is simply an output. Now, internal to this module, I'm going to set up an internal register called, I don't know, R. And then I'm going to say that always on the positive edge of clock, I want R to be equal to R plus one. Okay, that's great. So on every clock, R is going to increment. But what about Y? Well, I'm going to say that I'm going to assign Y equals R so that y always tells me what the state of r is. Um, notice that this is not clocked, so it's just y is whatever r is at that time. Okay, now let me go into the formal method. And again, we define the API, and we define our signals to be connected to our module. Let's get rid of the assertions. Okay. So here's the thing, how exactly do we test a counter? Well, earlier I said that uh, in order to test a counter, really what you want to test is that, you know, given some state n, you reach state n plus one. So you would think that you would want to assert that y is equal to, well, what is it equal to? Well, it, it's the, the past y plus one. But, you know, what exactly is past y? Well, you can define logic in your formal module. So, for example, I might say, well, we're going to keep past y around. So we're going to call, uh, we're going to call this past y. And always at positive edge of clock, we want past y to store y. So now whenever we access past y, that's going to be y as it was one clock earlier. Uh, the other thing that I want to do is only run these assertions on the positive edge of the clock. Now you could do this on the negative edge of the clock, uh, but then there is a special option that you need to specify, which is multi-clock on, because then um, I think the engine needs to know that uh, this clock is not actually synchronized with the prover clock or something like that. I, again, I'm, I'm no real expert in formal verification. I just know enough to get this done. So anyway, uh, so this is the thing. Now, if I try to prove this, it's going to fail pretty much immediately. And for the most part, the reason is that uh, I haven't initialized my register. And of course, I haven't initialized past y. So these could start at any random point. So immediately, uh, because y is going to be random and past y is going to be random, uh, the prover or the bounded model checker is just going to pick random values that violate this assertion and say, oops, the, the assertion is violated. Sorry, doesn't work. So let's take a look and try it. Okay, uh, this passes for the cover stage. Um, let's remove that task completely. 
because we're not doing any cover statements. We're just doing bounded model checking. So there we go, we failed, and it will output a trace showing us why it failed. Now, if we take a look at why it failed, we can see, all right, so there's our clock toggling along. There's past y, 0, and there's y, 0 and 1. And you might ask yourself, uh, well, it looks like past y is 0, but in fact, there is a positive transition right over here. And what's the past of y here? Well, it's, it's basically random. It, it's sort of like off the beginning of time. It's prior to the beginning of time. So this is a typical problem that you're going to run into when you're trying to validate clock logic. And there's a formula that you use, a kind of a recipe. You create a single bit called past valid. And you initialize it to 1. So initial, uh, you initialize it to 0. And then you say, always at the positive edge of the clock, past valid gets 1. So what this means is that past valid is going to start out at zero, then you're going to get one clock, and then past valid is going to be one. At that point, you can check past values. So we're going to fix this up by saying if past valid, then assert that past y is y. Now this may still fail, again, because random values, but Let's just see what happens. Oh, and actually it passed. So this is nice. Um, and again, the reason, the reason that it passed is because uh, we skipped effectively one cycle. So we sort of allowed the counter to increment from whatever random value it started with. Now, it's possible that there may be a bug in your counter implementation where you know, you start from a random value and it will increment um, and then fail at some point. So for example, let's just introduce a bug. So if R is equal to 64-bit value hex a a a a 0, 0, 0, 0, then R gets 0, else R increments. So this will work um, as long as you don't count up so high that it reaches this value and then it'll go back down to zero. So this is a bug that we've introduced and let's see what happens when we run this. Okay, actually it shows that bounded model checking failed and it's giving us a trace. So we can find out why. And in fact, you could see that it says, well, when y is a a a a 0 0 0 0 in the past, then the next clock is 0, which of course is incorrect. So it has actually figured out which inputs cause this assertion to fail. So let's go on to k induction or the prove mode. So I'm going to change this task to prove mode. And let's just get rid of the bug. So what prove mode does is it basically says, okay, here's 10 steps. So I'm going to assume that this is correct. I think the way it works is um, it converts assertions to assumptions. So there's another keyword that you can use called assume. And in fact, what we can do is we can assume past valid equals zero initially. And what that will actually do is force the engine to assume that past valid is zero initially. So it's just another way of saying the same thing, but it sort of restricts the inputs. Uh, and by input, I also mean the internal state of uh, the simple formal module. So uh, what prove mode does is it turns all of the assertions into assumptions. So it says, okay, I'm going to fix the inputs 
so that this is true. I'm going to assume that, and I'm going to force that to be true. Then, on the last step, I'm going to turn all the assertions on. And I'm going to make sure that if in the past 10 states um, the inputs are correct, then is it true that the next state is going to be correct? So if we run this, well, we can see that it passed. And you can see that there's some additional logging about induction. If we introduce a bug, so if r is our old friend a a a a 0 0 0 0 r gets 0 else r gets r plus 1 so if we introduce that bug uh -huh, we can see that it failed unfortunately it failed with a crash uh, i assume that that's a bug that's going to be fixed but the point is that um, there is actually a trace engine zero trace induct dot vcd so let's take a look at it so it's simple formal underscore the mode which is uh, prove engine zero trace induct dot vcd okay and let's see what it found all right so you can see that there's a whole bunch of clocks and again this is this is a function of the number of time steps that we allow it. So it says, assume that the assertions are true for uh, how many steps? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps, and then take a look at the last one. So I'm just going to expand this a little bit. All right. So we can see that y is, let's see, AAA9, FFF8, uh, FFFB, so you can guess what's going to happen. It continues. And then, of course, you can see that it goes to AAA0000 and then down to 0. And that is where the induction fails. So. Um, one thing is that it does have this sort of extra cycle at the end. You can kind of ignore that. This is where the induction actually fails, right here. So basically what, it, what it's done is um, it's assumed that your assertion is correct, and indeed the assertions are correct, until the assertion is no longer correct. So it's... Uh, a more rigorous way of proving that a more complicated state machine will actually work. So let's play around with this a little more. Let's suppose that this is actually a register that you can write to, for example. So I'm going to say input logic 63 down to 0. Uh, we'll just call it in the output is still going to be the value of the register, but here what we're going to do is we're going to say in, uh, no, r gets in. That's it. Now this is fairly straightforward. There's not really a whole lot that you can do for formal verification. But let's go ahead and copy the API over. Copy the signals over. All right, we'll keep our past y. Uh, do we need that? Maybe? Maybe we need that? OK, we need our past valid because we're going to check uh, from one state to the next. And if the past is valid, then y should be equal to past y, right? So regardless of what you write, that should be output. So this is a fairly simple check. Let's just make sure that this is actually working. Uh, we're running under prove mode. Oh, we failed. That's interesting. Why did we fail? So let's take a look. So here's clock, here's in, here's past valid, there's past y, and there's y. So why did we fail? Zoom in. 
Actually, let's do something simpler, which is go to BMC mode. Right, and we can limit the depth to something like five because really all we need are two clock cycles. So let's run this and we failed. Let's find out why. So this is running under BMC mode and it's engine zero and the trace file is trace.vcd. Okay, let's take a look. There we go. The trace is a lot shorter now. It's only three clock cycles. So we can see that past Y is zero. Uh, no, here we go. Past Y in is eight followed by zeros. The reason is that we actually want to test against past in, not past Y. Now, again, we can go through the trouble of defining this past variable for in, but instead we're going to use a little syntactic sugar, it's called dollar past of in. Okay, and one of the keys is that whenever you see dollar past, you should make sure that your past is valid. Uh, because otherwise, uh, the engine, uh, it, it's basically undefined behavior what the past um, prior to the beginning of time actually is. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the test again and it passed. So that's fairly straightforward. You know, whatever we wrote is whatever we are looking at now. Let's suppose we had a write enable. So input logic write enable. So here, always on the positive edge of the clock, only if write enable is true, then we load the register. Otherwise, we just leave it alone. So we're going to have to copy the API. Copy the signal over. Now if we run this test, it's obviously going to fail because most likely the solver is going to not activate write enable. So let's take a look if that's true. And done is fail. And if we look at the trace to find out why it failed, well, we can see that write enable remained at zero all the time. And the initial value of the register is probably just random. So where's the register? Right here. Okay, so the initial value of the register is zero. And you can see that the past input was eight. Um, and the current input is zero. So that certainly didn't work because we have some random input, we didn't actually write it, and then we're testing that y is the same as what we attempted to write when we actually didn't write it. So how do we fix this? What we want to do is say, because an assertion, the assertion should hold for every clock cycle in this case. But here we want to say that if the past of write enable was true, then we want to make this assertion. Now let's see what happens. Okay, we've passed. This is good. And in fact, what we can do, let's use a cover statement to figure out how exactly do we write into this register? Now, this is a simple register. We know how to write into it. Basically, you set write enable, you set your input, you clock it, and then you can read the output immediately. But let's suppose you didn't know that, right? So let's add an additional statement. Cover that, uh, let's say, y is equal to, well, let's pick our magical value. How do we end up in this state? Okay, now there are two ways that we can end up in this state. The first way is that we actually write this value. But the second way is if you look at our uh, register, you can see that it's not initialized to any particular value. And we don't have actually a reset signal here. 
So the engine is free to choose any initialization value of R it wants. And what it's going to do is it's going to pick this as an initialization value. So instead, what I'm just going to do is, is I'm going to initialize R to 0. Take away BMC mode and, well, actually, let's keep BMC mode so that we can keep our assertions. And we'll add cover mode, mode cover. Now again, I'm pretty sure that with a depth of five clocks, we can actually reach that cover statement. So let's see what happens. Okay, so here we see that we've passed BMC and we've also passed cover. So cover is going to give us a trace. How do we get into that state? Let's take a look. Okay, and honestly, this is almost magical to me that it's actually able to find a state where the cover statement is true. So you can see that it decided that you must set the input to a a a a zero 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 zero. You must set write enable high, and then on the next clock, write enable goes low, and the output goes to a a a a zero 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 zero. It's almost magical, but it's actually mathematical. It's mathematical. So anyway, that's a really, really simple introduction to uh, formal verification. So we've covered uh, bounded model checking, we've covered prove mode or induction mode. Not in any great detail, there are differences. Now what I suggest you do is you go to zipcpu.com so this is a blog that has a lot about formal, formal verification. Uh, so for example, um, if you, okay, so if you just do a search for zip CPU and formal, you'll see my first experience with formal methods. So it basically talks about, you know, the bounded model check, the induction, um, formal declarations, it talks about assume, it talks about, um, it talks about, okay, there's rows and stable. So these are actually some nice keywords that are built in. Um, briefly, stable for something means that the past of x is equal to x. In other words, it hasn't changed. In other words, it's stable. Rows, um, and I think this is only value, valid for single bit values. So rows implies that x was 0 and now it's 1. So in other words, the past of x was 0 and currently x is 1. And of course, fell is the opposite, where the past of x is true and x is no longer true. Now one of the pit, one of the other interesting things is that not fell, what does that imply? Well it doesn't imply rows, it could also imply stable as well. So you know be careful with with um, negating fell and rows. Finally past also has an additional syntax where past of x comma 1 means the past of x. Past of x comma 2 means x as it was two clock cycles ago. So it would be equivalent to the past of the past of x and so on. You could, you know, keep increasing that. One pitfall with this is that you have to make sure that the past is valid. So if you're using some value two cycles ago, then you need to make sure that the beginning of time was at least two cycles ago. And how would you do that? Well, you have a past valid. You could also include a past valid two, for example, like this. Logic past valid two. Okay. Initially, we're going to assume that past valid is two. And then always at the positive edge of the clock, if the past is valid, then 
passed valid two gets one. And then you want to gate all of your assertions and covers on past valid two. So now you could be assured that there were two clock cycles in the past. And now dollar past in comma two is always valid. It doesn't go past the beginning of time. So that's what that's all about. So there are a lot of examples on this website um, and they are in general a little bit more complicated than the very simple examples that I've shown. That's because I only wanted to give you an extremely gentle introduction to formal verification just to get you started, just to install the packages and just to get some really dirt simple examples running. That's really all I wanted to cover. So again, here is that So again, here is that one pager where you can get Yosis and Symbiosis and Yisis. Those are all required. Uh, GTK Wave, which I highly recommend because if you've got traces, you're going to have to display them somehow, and that's what GTK Wave is for. And then if you're using uh, Visual Studio Code, which I also recommend, you should install the Verilog HDL System Verilog extension and also install Icarus Verilog. And then I should probably say that for, let's see, uh, file, what is it, preferences, settings, if you just search for Verilog, you can see that the linter is set to iVerilog. There are these other things, but I think um, there's Verilator, there's ModelSim. So, and I don't think Verilator actually runs under Windows, or if it does, it's really difficult to get running. So, you know, just stick with iVerilog. Uh, okay, I think that's about it. So, I hope this was helpful. Again, I didn't cover everything, and I'm not an expert in formal verification. I'm just an amateur. I just got started with this. So thanks for watching. See ya.